Um, good morning. I feel like I need to change my sign on to, hey, all you cool cats and kittens, because all I did on Sunday was watch Tiger King. And now I feel like that's how I want to start every single one of these videos. If you don't know what I'm talking about, good for you, because if you've watched it, it's terrible. Um, we're doing 4.2 Existence and Uniqueness. And if you've probably gotten the idea from all of the previous chapters that we've looked at in Diff EQ, um, we typically see this 0.2 lesson as our Existence and Uniqueness section. So um, got a little tweet here for you. If you haven't already read it, you can enjoy that. Um, but yeah, so this is all about the existence and uniqueness of our first order linear systems. So part of this, um, in order to determine existence and uniqueness, is we have to take our system and we have to get it into matrix form. And that's what's going to be that we're going to use that to define existence and uniqueness. So um, essentially here, and as you can see, obviously, this is all written out. I wasn't going to retype this. I had it written out from last year. So that's what we're doing right now. Um, if I have n number of first order linear differential equations, okay, where essentially we have some p of t being multiplied by a y1, some other p of t being multiplied by a y2, on and on and on um, until we get down to a constant g of t down here. Um, and then also with any number of corresponding initial values, if this is an initial value problem, that y sub one would have an initial value, y sub two would have an initial value, and all the way down to y sub n. So this is my system of differential equations. We are going to define this, like I said, as a matrix equation. And so this is going to be super important that you can get this rewritten. Um, in the correct form in this section. That's really going to be the biggest thing for this section. So basically what that's going to look like in matrix form, ooh, there we go, um, is if I take all of my um, first order derivatives right here, y primes, and I write this as a vector value function. So what we have here is you can see for all of these y's, they are listed with our vector notation over them. Same with g here. So these are all vector value functions. And I actually did get a new stylus, by the way. Um, we'll see how well it works. I think, you know what? It could just be me, and I was blaming it on my old stylus the whole time, and really it's just me. That is quite possible. So either way. That's neither here nor there. Um, so writing these all in vector value function form here, we would have our general form y prime of t is equal to p of t, y of t, plus g of t. So, and then we would also get all of our initial values into vector form as well. Okay, so what that's gonna look like in terms of p of t is this is going to be essentially our coefficient matrix. Now, again, these could be coefficients like just plain old numbers, or they could be coefficients uh, that are, in fact, functions of t. So this matrix is going to be n by n. Um, so that's your P of t matrix, okay? And then we have y of t, g of t, and then, like I said, we get those initial values in there as well. So, um, oh gosh, I had a note here. Yeah. Um, anyway, y of t just looks like all of my solutions for y. y1, y2, all the way to y sub n are all solutions of this differential equation. Because again, remember, we're solving for the function y. Um, G of T would be all the constants that we've added onto the end. And if we have an initial value problem, that that would be in our matrix form here as well. Okay. So take a second if you need to pause the video, make sure you have all of this down. This is essentially taking our system of differential equations, putting it into that matrix form. Okay. Once you have that written down, 
theorem 4.1 is our existence and uniqueness theorem. Okay, so it says if the n squared components of P of T and the n components are G of, of G of T are all continuous on the interval A, B, and our T sub zero, our initial value for T does exist on A, B, then our initial value problem does have a unique solution. So we're looking for continuity on the interval from A to B um, for both P and G. Okay, and also that our initial value t sub zero exists in that interval. Okay, if that's the case, then we have a unique solution. All right, well, how do we check for continuity? Um, we, we check for limits, right? We look for limits, we, um, we look for intervals of, um, of continuity just through our derivatives, okay? So let's do an example here. We have y1 prime equal to sine 2t times y1 plus 1 over t squared minus 2t minus 8 times y2, y sub 2, plus 4. My dog's being needy. All right, so then we have y2 prime is equal to the natural log of the absolute value t plus 1 times y sub 1 plus e to the negative 2t y sub 2 plus secant t. So this is um, pretty much in the form that we want it to be in. Uh, we don't have to rearrange terms is kind of what I'm, I mean in terms of the form we want it to be in. So no rearranging of terms really, just getting it into that matrix form. We do have an initial value problem here. So our t sub zero in this case is one. Now notice that that has to match um, for each of our initial values here. So if we have, um, in this case, two um, solutions, y sub 1, y sub 2, our t sub 0 has to be the same for each of those. So getting this into matrix form, and um, you can kind of peek when the note goes transparent there, I want you to go ahead and pause the video here, take a second, write out what this looks like in the standard matrix form of the equation, and make sure you include the initial value as well. All right, so if you've paused and done that, I'm going to go ahead and reveal here what that looks like. All right, so we have our P of T is equal to sine 2T. Um, it's just, I'm not going to read the elements again. Um, all of the elements are the coefficients in front of Y1. We got those lined up here. The ones in front of Y sub 2 are lined up here. I'll spare you me reading them again. All right, so sine of 2t is continuous everywhere. 2 just affects the period and the frequency of our function, so um, we are not worried about continuity. It's negative infinity to positive infinity that t exists on. Now, obviously, for this element right here, we do have some discontinuity in this rational function, so our intervals for t would look as such. All right, same thing with natural log. We do have a discontinuity here at negative one. All right, um, we can't take the natural log of zero, so that causes us our only domain issue. So, um, and then, you know, for e to the negative 2t, like sine of 2t, our interval for t is negative infinity to positive infinity. Now, remember, we're not just looking at p of t, okay? Um, y of t here, our solutions, so we're not looking at that. P of t and g of t are our two that we need to look at. So for g of t, we have a negative infinity to positive infinity for this element four here. Now secant, if you don't remember the graph of secant, this is where your calculator could come in handy. Um, secant has discontinuities everywhere cosine is equal to zero. And so cosine is equal to zero at intervals of pi units starting at, you know, wherever you want to start. But for us, well, I just started at negative pi over two, given that the t sub zero here we're evaluating is one. So my intervals for t look like this when it comes to secant. And I am trying to find, this is like our other existence and uniqueness. I'm trying to find the largest interval on which our t sub zero exists. If t sub zero is equal to one, then, you know, if I was just looking at this rational, rational function here, I would say negative two to four. 
Well, then that narrows a bit because here where I look at my natural log function, um, I have a discontinuity at negative one. So that window narrows to be negative one to four, right? Um, if I see my other discontinuities that I have here, I would want to make sure I know that pi over two is equal to about 1.57. So that narrows my window that much more. Okay, so T sub zero being equal to one um, exists and is unique on the interval from negative one to pi over two. So just kind of narrowing that window uh, based on your discontinuities until you find the largest window possible.